Hi, I'm Megan Heinz. I'm a senior data scientist at BuzzFeed. Um, my talk today is Recipe to Vec, or How Does My Robot Know Which Recipes Are Related? This is basically going to be a case study in how we used Recipe to Vec to create a consumer facing data product uh, for Tasty. So if you're not aware of Tasty, um, this is basically BuzzFeed's cooking brand. There are these like top-down, sped-up cooking videos that you've probably seen on Facebook. This basically came about when Facebook made their algorithm change that started biasing towards video. Um, BuzzFeed data scientists did a bunch of experimentation and figured out not only was uh, Facebook biasing towards video, but very specifically to 90 second long videos. So we figured cooking was a great format for that and we basically exploited the hell out of that and grew a huge fan base. So we expanded to from our Facebook page to YouTube pages, Snapchat, and Instagram. And this was really, really successful for us. Um, the general manager of Tasty um, always says we're like the biggest cooking brand in the world right now. Not really sure which metric she's using to measure that by, but it certainly sounds nice. Um, but this kind of had two problems for us. Um, first of all, I, as much as we were able to exploit that initial Facebook algorithm change, we were incredibly vulnerable to kind of the subsequent algorithm changes. So we didn't really own our users. They were like all out on these distributed platforms. And the other side of this is that we knew that both through like looking at our own data and through user research that people were actually trying to cook these recipes and it was a pretty miserable process for them. So we would see that people were like scrubbing and watching little sections of the video over and over again as they were trying to kind of desperately jot down the ingredients and the preparation steps. So that was just not great. So we decided to remedy that and build two new destinations. So both our iOS app and our website so that we can kind of control that experience um, and like give people a really easy way to come in and find these recipes and actually cook them. So we knew kind of from the beginning that we wanted to create a related recipes module. And we wanted to do this for two reasons. Um, one, kind of selfishly, we wanted to be able to recirculate users from our most recently published uh, new recipes to our older recipes. And then for kind of the user-centric uh, uh, reason, we saw from our own data on BuzzFeed.com's video pages that people would tend to look at the same type of recipes in a session. So they would look at a couple of dinner recipes or a couple of meal prep recipes or a couple of dessert recipes. So we kind of understood that when someone was looking for a recipe, they did know generally what they wanted to cook and that we could help them out by kind of narrowing that potentially exhaustive search to a couple of like related recipes for them. So. That kind of begs the question, why do you even really need a data scientist to work on this? Don't we have video producers and chefs that can tell us which of our recipes are related? Um, turns out, not really. Um, if you have ever worked with user-generated data, you will know that most of the time it is utter garbage. Um, we worked to get our uh, producers to tag like what they thought was a dinner recipe or a breakfast recipe or comfort food or dessert, and it ended up being like, giant, a giant, giant, giant mess. My favorite example of like really awful human tagging is we had this like list of mocktails, which are like, yes, technically they do not have alcohol in them, but I certainly do not want you recommending that my child drink a Moscow mule. Um, another one that like drove me completely insane was we had these little like cocktail teriyaki meatballs that you would have at like a fancy uh, like cocktail party and they were all tagged as breakfast. And I was like, really, Who, who's eating this for breakfast? So we know that we can't really rely on humans to do this, so we're going to have to figure out some way to do this programmatically. The first kind of thing we thought about in, in order to kind of categorize this data was use the list of ingredients. So we thought that maybe we could use these as categorical variables. So first we thought, you know, maybe we can use dummy coding. Um, you might have used this before with pandas get dummies, which basically takes all of your categories and turns them into a binary uh, dimension, so zeros and ones for whether or not the ingredient is present in the recipe. Uh, the other way that you can do this is label encoding, where you take your list of categories or words and you convert them into a list of numbers. Um, both of these methods uh, kind of have issues for us. Um, 
in Git Dummies, you're adding a dimension for every ingredient, thus increasing the dimensionality. We have the cursor dimensionality. Our data becomes sparser and sparser. It's harder to converge on a solution. Um, for label encoding, we have a different issue. We're kind of implying that there's some type of order or ordinality in our world. And there's nothing in the physical world that tells me that apple should be two and yogurt should be 3,000. Both of these uh, methods have the same issue that we had a lot of different ingredients in our recipe space that were very, very similar, but would be encoded completely differently. So things like 2% Greek yogurt and Greek yogurt would be two totally different columns with the dummy coding uh, method, and they could be totally different numbers with the label encoding method and not even close together. So they might be like 10,000 or like 12. So there's some other more advanced techniques like polynomial and Helmert, um, but none of them really like solve these um, issues for us. So we're not going to move forward with this method. Instead, we're going to take a, a word embedding approach. And for word embeddings, you have this raw text of corpus, text corpus in our instance recipes, and you create vector representations of the words in the corpus. So in this example, eggplant ends up being this list of small floating point numbers. The kind of intuition behind this is that when you plot these vectors in n-dimensional space, the similar words will end up spatially closer together than the dissimilar words. So like dolphin and porpoise are close together, but uh, Paris and camera are relatively far apart. There are actually a lot of different ways to make word embeddings, but they all kind of coalesce around the same idea that a word is characterized by the company that it keeps. Um, one very simple way to make them is through TF-IDF, term frequency inverse document frequency, which basically looks at the frequency of the term in the document versus in the rest of the corpus. Um, kind of gives you an idea that the is not that important, but maybe uh, the word mango is more important. Um, there's another family of word embedding methods um, that are word-to-word co-occurrence matrices, uh, the most famous of which is GLOVE, which was developed at Stanford. It's a log bilinear model with the weighted least squares objective. And then there's another family of them in neural networks, the most famous of which is word to vec which is developed at Google, and it's essentially a two-layer neural network. That is actually the one that I ended up using. Um, word to vec has two different implementations. Uh, one of them is skipgram, and one is continuous bag of words. We're going to talk about skipgram today, and I'll kind of throw in how that's different from uh, CBO as we go through it. So how we actually implement this is we take a sentence like, add sugar, vanilla, and salt, and then be beat until very smooth. We decompose this into context words and target words. Um, your context words have like a window. So in this example, we have a window of one word, but you probably have something like five or 10 words that you're looking at. So add and vanilla end up being the context words for sugar. Sugar and and are the context words for vanilla, and so on and so forth. Each of these words is initialized with a random vector of very, very small values. You take those vectors and you try to protect the context words from the target words using a softmax regression classifier, which is basically a generalization of logistic regression. So in, in continuous back of words, it's actually the opposite. You're trying to, trying to predict the target words from the context words. Um, these are basically like tricks to generate additional uh, training samples uh, for your model. So the first time around, uh, when you make this prediction, it's going to be complete garbage because you have totally random vectors. Um, but that's OK, because you're going to go back and update your word vectors, take a small step in order to maximize your objective function using stochastic gradient descent, which is basically a hill climbing method, and back propagation, which updates the weights in your neural networks layer. You're just going to do this over and over and over again until you reach some type of stopping criteria, uh, be it maximum number of iterations, or your word vectors stop changing very much. And this is kind of what it looks like from uh, a neural network standpoint. You have your input vector, your hidden layer of linear neurons, which you're updating with backpropagation, and your output softmax classifier, which give, is giving you a probability of each word. The way that word to vec is different from the other neural network implementations are these three things, uh, word pairs and phrases, subsampling, and negative sampling. So in word pairs and phrases, um, previous implementations had just treated every single word as a completely separate entity. So the canonical example from uh, 
Google's paper was Boston Globe now has its own word vector rather than being two separate vectors for Boston and Globe, which is important for us because obviously that has a very separate meaning together than it does uh, apart. Um, the other thing that happened is they implemented subsampling, which basically takes all the really frequent words and decreases their uh, occurrences in the training samples because it really doesn't help us that much to constantly be uh, recalculating the vector for the. Uh, another thing that happened was negative sampling. So before, once you made a prediction, you would go back and update the word vectors for all the words that were not the predicted word. Um, and that just take takes a lot of time and a lot of computation. So instead, we're gonna just randomly select a couple of words that are not the predicted word and update those, rather than uh, updating all the vectors for the entire corpus. And then obviously you also uh, update the vector for the positive word, which is the word you should have predicted. So once we have these word embeddings, how do we actually go about evaluating them? Um, these are like 70, 100, 200 dimensions long. Um, we can look at this cube and see that like as humans, we're really not even able to evaluate three dimensions. So we're probably gonna start with some type of dimensionality reduction technique. Um, and there are a couple of different ways to do this. Um, I think earlier in the conference, we learned about a new one called UMAP. Um, but generally, we have the matrix factorization methods like principal component analysis or PCA, and the neighbor graph methods like TSNE. Um, I kind of find uh, PCA a little more intuitive, but we're actually gonna use TSNE um, for this method. And that's basically because it's been found to be a little bit better for visualization. It won this kind of prestigious Kaggle award, and it kind of saw solves this thing called the crowding problem, where all your observations end up in the center of your plot. Um, now, it's not a silver bullet, though. Um, it can be a little difficult to interpret these plots. Um, first of all, uh, hyperparameters really, really matter. Uh, perplexity, which is basically the knob that tunes um, whether or not something is a neighbor, um, can really drastically change the output of your visualization. So you're going to want to like maybe look at a few different versions of this. Um, even with the exact same hyperparameters, every time you make one of these visualizations, it's going to come back a little bit different. Um, you also don't really want to over-interpret these plots. So the size of the cluster and the distances don't necessarily mean anything. Um, so I went ahead and after training my uh, word to vec model on preparation steps in my recipes, looked at the word embeddings for, I think, the 100 most common ingredients in my data set. So I apologize, the font is a little small here, but in blue, we see all of our different like pastas, like spaghetti and linguine are together. In this purple, all of our alcohols, like bourbon and gin and whiskey are together. In red is um, espresso and coffee. And up in the top in green is sage, rosemary, and thyme. So we can kind of see that our model is learning something interesting and uh, useful about this food space just from the fact that I'm a human and I know that uh, pastas should be closer together. Um, and, but that's not really enough. We want to look at this from another perspective as well. So we're going to look at the cosine similarity uh, of these vector embeddings. Um, in the original paper, uh, the relationship that was used to kind of tune this uh, model was looking at countries and their capital cities. Uh, now in the food space, we don't really have uh, these like strongly defined relationships where I know like how similar an apple should be to an orange. Um, but I do have an idea that salad should be much less similar to cake as tort, and guacamole should be much, much less similar to, similar to chocolate as it is to cocoa and ganache. So once I've kind of played around with this and I feel confident that my model is learning something interesting about the food space, um, what do I do with them? I don't want related ingredients. I want related recipes. Um, the nice thing about word embeddings is they're kind of modular. You can kind of add them up, sum them, and they retain a lot of the same meaning. The kind of canonical example of this is, of course, king minus the vector for man plus woman is very similar to the vector for queen. So we're going to use that same concept, and we're going to sum up all the word embeddings for all the words in our recipe's preparation steps in order to create our recipe vector. From there, we're going to go back to TSNE and evaluate um, how our recipe vectors are looking. 
So I know that I said that humans were really terrible at tagging, uh, but we are showing some tags from our um, producers where healthy is in blue, comfort food in yellow, desserts in green, and alcoholic beverages in purple. We can kind of see that desserts in green are smeared across the bottom, uh, comfort food and healthy food near the top. They're kind of like mixed in together because to be honest, uh, none of Tasty's recipes are that healthy, so I'm saying healthy-ish. <laughs> But we can kind of see that like uh, we ended up with like all these eggnog recipes together. Kind of we've got our meal prep recipes close together. We have a bunch of like kind of duplicate recipes like turtle, uh, turtle brownies and they also ended up together. Kind of our meal prep recipes are together. So we feel pretty good about um, how these recipe vectors are looking. So we're gonna move on and we're actually gonna productionize this and use this as a module on our website. So the way that we actually productionized this is we had our MySQL database with our structured recipes. We have a queue reader that uses uh, the GinSim implementation of word to vec that pulls in our preparation steps, trains our word to vec model, we create our recipe vectors, and then from there we use cosine similarity to find, to find the 20 recipes that are most similar to each recipe. We store that in Redis, which is our key value um, store. Tasty API retrieves that and then serves it to TastyCo and Tasty App. We're publishing about 15 to 20 recipes a week. You know, video production takes a while. Um, we apply this um, uh, model every time a new recipe is created to the stale model, and then we completely retrain the model every 12 hours. So this is um, what it actually looks like on our website today. Um, I was really excited when I saw these sample results. Um, we have a lot of these like cheese stuffed in meat recipes. Um, and we like found all of the cheese stuffed in meat recipes. It's not really what I would like to have for dinner, but I think a lot of our fans love these recipes. Um, previously, we probably would have just had to rely on tags um, in order to populate this module. And I'm gonna tell you that about half of these were tagged as healthy, so you can see why that would be probably problematic. <laughs> um, another example is this like spring berry pie. We found all these kind of like meringue, cheesecakey, like fruit desserts to show up. Previously, we've, all we would have been able to do is show desserts, which at least was a little more uh, accurate than the healthy tag. Um, another example with like this broccoli uh, rice stir fry, we've got all these kind of like weeknight like rice and meat dinners together. All of our alcoholic beverages are grouped together. Um, there are some like weird quirks in this though. We do have like things that are very similar with respect to their preparation steps. They're actually quite different in their use. So like this pina colada recipe is very, very similar obviously to these smoothie recipes, but I would say with respect to user intent, we are much closer to the peach rosarita or the uh, berry uh, vodka sunrise. Um, one of the other things that came up was actually this gazpacho recipe was also very similar to these uh, smoothie recipes, which it is basically like vegetable or like a fruit that you like blended in a smoothie. So it makes sense that that would happen. Um, you can kind of just use some simple heuristics, but in general, this was like way better than we ever could have done just using human tags. So these are kind of some other ways that we either are, are already are or investigating using at Tasty. Um, so we can try to predict the performance of new recipes um, based on the performance of older similar recipes, create kind of more context aware recommendations, kind of com combining collaborative filtering with these recipe similarity metrics, um, making recommendations to producers about what types of recipes they should be making. Um, and generally they're very useful for in features for our various machine learning applications. Um, so yeah, that is the end of my talk today. Uh, I'm available for questions. <laughs> BuzzFeed's also hiring. If you're interested, get in contact with me. We have a mic up here for questions where I can shove the plug around. What's your, uh, how, how big is your training set and what's the dimension of your uh, vector space? And what's the dimension after you do the dimension reduction? Sure, so we have about 3,000 recipes. We augmented that with another 10,000. Um, we have 70 dimension vectors. Uh, we kind of played around with different dimensions for that. Um, 
I had just like these giant spreadsheets where I was like polling my coworkers on what they thought was a good result. And I didn't see huge differences moving from like 70, 70 to 100. So 70, I think, is the default from uh, Word to VX paper. And we felt that actually worked pretty well. Uh, I feel like there was another part of your question, though. Yes, uh, after the dimension reduction. Oh, just two dimensions. Just two. Yeah. Cool. And another question. Uh, uh, for the word to vec model, um, the, the, the weight of the neural net mm -hmm. is, is um, updated after each uh, gradient descent. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the vectors are also updated. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't understand why this thing actually converge, or does it converge? So it, more like the vectors stop changing very much, or you say, like, I'm going to do a 1,000 iterations, and after that, I'm done. OK, so it just OK. Yeah. Thank you. Have you guys um, thought about adding nutritional information? Yes, that is a, <laughs> that is a big project this summer. We have uh, a lot of people who are working on that right now. We kind of uh, initially st shied away from that because we were looking at these recipes with like a pound of mozzarella cheese and we're like, yeah, it's a lot. It's going to be a lot of calories. <laughs> so we were kind of scared to initially add that in. Um, yeah. But we were working on it right now. We have a product or a de product design intern who's doing mock-ups and we are looking at different um, sources of uh, nutritional databases. Like there's a couple that um, New York Times uses and we're trying to figure out which are kind of accurate enough. OK, we'll rotate one over here. How much of the recipe article is brought in through the word to vec algorithm? Because I know a lot of recipe sites will have like a couple paragraphs before kind of just chatty about the recipe that don't talk about technical stuff, but might impart some wisdom in terms of the user intent, like you were talking about mm -hmm. with alcoholic beverages. So we're primarily video. So we actually don't have those like long like um, paragraphs about the recipe. And it, we actually kind of consider that one of our strengths is like, I know I go to like sites and want to look at recipes and I'm like, wow, you're, I'm like reading about your whole life, but I just really wanted to make these muffins. <laughs> right. So right now we just use the preparation steps. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, this is actually a kind of a related question. I'm curious, um, when you split the, the ingredient list into these contexts and target words, is that a manual process, or do you do that sort so of? So it's actually not the ingredient lists. Um, or the, it's I the, guess the preparation steps. Yeah. yeah. Um, we had initially like had all these like random plain text files of these recipes from the last like four years and we structured that into a database um, for the purpose of making the app and the website so we it did, wasn't a manual process we just used mysql and then kind of munched them in python i see but you need to specify which are contacts and which are target uh, no that that's all kind of handled by jensen's implementation oh, okay. yeah cool and you like one of the important parts of that is um, setting your window size. So you could say like my context is five words around or ten words around, and that's like an interesting hyperparameter to play around with. So are you trying? Are you trying to predict the next word? Is that? So you are in. Uh, there's two implementations. There's continuous bag of words and skip gram. And skip gram, you are you are trying to uh, predict. I believe it's the the context words from the target word, and then the opposite. There are like two different versions where you're trying to predict the target word or you're trying to pick the context words. I see. Okay, we'll switch again over here. Have you seen uh, an increase in clicks on recipes since implementing the algorithm? So this is a, a launch feature. So yes, we had zero clicks. <laughs> <laughs> we initially took this approach um, because we were building a brand new website. So we didn't have any historical data. So we have other recommendation engines at BuzzFeed that are kind of more uh, typical item to item collaborative filtering. Um, but we chose to take a, a purely context uh, aware approach because we didn't have any historical data. Hi, so I see that you took kind of like an NLP route to trying to solve this problem, and I'm curious because mm -hmm. there's tons of ways of being able to vectorize words. What mm -hmm. made you settle on word to vec? Was it just the ease of understanding like how to use it, or had you tried multiple methods up to leading up to that, and that was just the best performing one? Um, I looked at a couple of different methods, and um, to be completely honest, Gen Sim's implementation was just so easy to use. It was like very much the like path of least resistance forward. I've kind of thought about using other uh, methods. I have an intern right now who's looking at Doctivec and another intern who's looking at Glove for different implementations. Um, but at the time, it just like worked really well and we were happy with it. 
And since we're a business, there were like tons of other fires to put out at the time. Fair enough. Thank you. A very interesting idea. It seems you are trying to create a virtual wag in uh, using the recipe, recipe uh, coppers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think is that reasonable? Because in virtual wag, you learn from the context. So basically, the word has a similar context, has a similar uh, vector. But like for, for example, in recipe for sugar, you can uh, have context in coffee and uh, molina, but you, you can also have the context like fried pork. I believe you have something like in Chinese food, like mm -hmm. the, the sweet, uh, sweet sugar pork. So do you think that will uh, create a similar vector for sugar? So w there is context in that we're using the preparation steps and not the ingredient lists, but we do have a very like specific type of recipe that we are training on. So I think you're right. If we like added some recipe from a totally different culture, probably our vectors would be pretty far off. Um, but luckily, we were only making vectors within this space where there's like the same like 20 people who are writing recipes. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question before we have this switch over. Hey, uh, great talk. I was wondering if you're tracking clicks through the website to like validate whether these recommendations are actually related or not. Yep. You are. <laughs> we track everything. Okay. And I guess are they pretty well? Well, so the one of the things is like we have that module and then we have a trending module and we really only show the trending module if we don't have similar recipes. Um, so what we are usually using to try to understand if this is working is the recirculation rate and the exit rate. So how often is someone actually clicking on another recipe or how often are they leaving the website entirely? Um, and right now it's uh, contributing a pretty substantial portion of our traffic. So pretty happy with it. I think there's still like a lot of uh, experimentation we could do to make sure this is really the best way to do it. But Right now, it works well. Cool. Thanks. All right, with that, let's thank Megan for an excellent talk. <laughs> <laughs>